so we will discuss one case and uh, specifically the topic is like that the role of us clinical pharmacologist in detecting in managing drug allergy so let's start presentation to So we will discuss one case here. Uh, this was a case from our uh, clinical pharmacology OPD at School of Tropical Medicine. So she, uh, she is a doctor of 33 years. Uh, just before taking her COVID-19 vaccination, she visited us. So for six <coughs> months, she was eligible for COVID-19 vaccination, but due to fear of this uh, allergy, drug allergy, she was not <coughs> taking that. Background, multiple drug allergy, incidence of drug allergy with multiple agents in last nine years and what we had done a detailed history taking and clinical examination so we'll discuss the episodes starting from the first episode uh, where uh, it, it was into 2012 january diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy and initiated with carbamazepine so after two days developed macular lesions all over her body with severe itching so carbamazepine was deprescribed uh, the rash was subsided with levocetrigine little bit a short course of oral corticosteroids and calamine lotion but the thing is that we all know now the hla phenotype is mandatory before initiating carbamazepine whether the 1502 allele is there or not according to current level but it is it was in 2012 i think that was not there in the level and 1502 allele was not done there that time again the second episode which was on 2012 july another episode of absence seizure happened now initiated with lamotrigine and levotiracetam after 6 weeks developed rash with fever workup done for different etiologies of fever and ultimately after 15 days of fever onset admitted in some acute care setting foul smelling discharges from different follicular areas of skin including uh, scalp and axilla leukocyte count was quite high we can see 40,000 with eosinophil 34% so she was diagnosed with dress the treatment started with IV deport methylprednisolone Lamotrigine was withdrawn and levotiracetam was continued. Finally, discharged with oral prednisolone, which was continued for six months. Now, third episode. Uh, she had a cart injury in 2017, started with amoxicillin clovulonic acid, developed high grade fever with macula, macular rashes and itching from day three of initiating that amoxicillin clavulonic acid so on day 5 it was deprescribed again treatment with oral prednisolone for 7 days and cetrigine finally fever and rash subsided by day 7 and day 9 <coughs> finally the 4th and 5th episodes 4th episodes was like that presented with acute onset articaria and hypotension only uh, clue was that uh, she has some exposure to certain chemicals doing some work in her microbiology lab and ultimately admitted in hospital emergency resuscitated with uh, adrenaline so this was the 2017 uh, episode finally the 2020 
there was a road traffic accident uh, she was prescribed with cefodoxim again after 5 days rashes with fever so immediately now she was feared because of that previous episodes of dress she stopped herself immediately and treated with prednisolone and levocetrizine it was subsided by 10th day so there are five episodes now she is asking whether she will take the vaccine yes or no so what is your opinion whether she can take and which vaccine any comment So taking you back to that point of time, I would have asked her not to take it <laughs> because <laughs> all the all the blame would go to the vaccine then. Okay, that was a time when the vaccine was required for anybody and everybody, and then any adverse event like this, okay, by uh, one is her own risk and uh, risk of the allergy. At the same time, the other risk of getting unprotected okay on the other hand if there is an event like this say for instance if this happens if, if she takes vaccine and there is a serious crisis that would send a negative message whereby many other people will not be yeah, taking absolutely vaccine absolutely it would isolated case <laughs> yeah <laughs> so for her better case. would have been not to take the vaccine yes, i don't sir. know what happened finally yes uh, i would uh, i would actually uh, not uh, pass the patient what does she want to do the doctor she is uh, her profession is something her profession is uh, this uh, lady this lady's profession is she's doctor no? yes, yes. Uh, something where she is more prone to get covid and other things so protection was even more uh, equally important so it was a you know tight rope uh, you know tight wa and a walk on a tight rope but at the same time uh, going by the icmr guidelines of that times not to be given at all but uh, going by the american guidelines or the guidelines we can do a graded uh, this uh, st start with the very small uh, dose and then go ahead with that. It's one thing that practicality of giving a vaccine at that time is really it has been you know, said by Sir and Dr. Taha and all. So, but there is one concept which we need to bear in mind for the future such things. Drug allergy per se is not a risk factor for vaccine allergy. It has been documented well. So we should keep in mind that drug allergy is not for the time of the pandemics, but otherwise, drug allergies are not a risk factor for any vaccine-related allergies because they have different mechanisms, it has been said. So this is a point which has to be bear in mind. Now let's see that what is thing happening in Chambo's case. Yeah. So first of all, I want to respond to my uh, sir's comment, that is Tripathi sir's comment. Sir, want to go back to that time and that time she want to uh, he want to stop uh, ask uh, ask the patient not to take the vaccine but i think sir you are now sitting in this time and now you are so confident and then you are going back to that time you are for this uh, uh, time you were sitting so that confidence give you more uh, favor in not taking the vaccine but at that cut that time the scenario was like that we are losing so many friends daily it is very hard to tell one of our uh, people not to take vaccine. So it is uh, again as as you always uh, teach us to balance between risk versus benefit. So risk of drug allergy here versus risk of getting COVID. So we need to balance that. So no, there are certain there is another kind of risk benefit analysis. One is risk to the person, okay, and benefit to the person. On the other hand, risk, risk of the, the whole program. Okay. Yes, the society. That yeah, that is that, that is also well taken, sir. But we need to analyze each episodes very uh, critically. So if, even if we go back to the first episode, so first episode wa was with carbamazepine, and what type of reaction it is, what type of hypersensitivity reaction it is. So we need to assess that. Second episode was with again the lamotrigine the this time it was a drug fever or even it develops dress so what type of hypersensitivity reaction it is again we need to understand 
third there was an again amoxicillin clavulonic uh, acid induced some macular rashes the duration the temporality is almost three days we need to understand the mechanism one important issue when when we are dealing with when we are asked about the covid 19 vaccine this gives us a lot of help the iv deport methyl prednisolone was used and we know that in the iv deport methyl prednisolone there is one excipient used that is the polysorbate and we know that in the covid vaccines specifically the covid shield i think there is an important component the excipient polysorbate so it was well taken again the, there is a very uh, so we can nullify the risk of excipient allergy here because already the patient got methyl prednisolone without any event fourth and fifth episodes fourth episode is typical a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction the anaphylaxis is there due to some exposure to uh, certain chemicals and fifth episodes again that is a delayed type of hypersensitivity reaction with some specific antibiotic that is cefodoxim so ultimately what we had done we had evaluated him the thoroughly on the fourth episode more closely Yes, sir. Because if you go to the previous slide, that the fourth episode exposure to chemicals in microbiology lab. She being a microbiologist, what is the new chemical she is exposed to? How did did she suspect that particular chemical? That is also to be looked into. Yeah. Go ahead. So when we we had a detailed evaluation, the most important uh, history was the previous vaccination history. That is uh, important, we, we took in details. Specifically, again, we need to take the history of hepatitis B and influenza vaccination because they carry some similar type of excipients like the COVID-19 vaccines. So there were no events. This uh, doctor took both those vaccination very recently. So ultimately, we had advised to take vaccine and she took vaccine without any event. So why this is important? Because uh, as an uh, evaluate uh, drug allergy specialist or even you can call as clinical pharmacologist, we need to understand the basic mechanism first. If we know about the mechanism of drug allergy, starting from the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, how this happens, I am not going in details, but we know the muscle exploitation how it happens when the Ig is going to attach with the FC epsilon receptor and uh, again the anti antigen will enter so there will be a, some reactions and they will release those mediators. <coughs> Most importantly it is also uh, important to note that sometimes the patient will tell I do not have any I, I, I took paracetamol previously I don't have that reaction this time I, I took paracetamol and I have reaction why so for allergy or type 1 hypersensitivity there is a requirement of sensitization sometimes again not always the sensitization is a must uh, thing but some mostly sensitization should be there so here we can understand how the sense patient can be sensitized and after certain times again re-exposure of that particular allergen can give the allergic reactions the mast cell degranulation so type 2 hypersensitivity is a different ball game so that is a locally reaction the targeted locally means that this is very cell specific reactions when some uh, antigen is sitting on top of the cell and some antibody is coming to touch on that particular uh, uh, antigen and then invites all those natural killer cells or complement systems uh, that ca can cause the lysis of the cell. Yes, there are uh, other parts like in case of myasthenia gravis or in case of uh, even the hyperthyroidism Graves disease. They are also the example of type 2 hypersensitivity reaction but today's discussion is not on that. And type 3 reaction is the immune complex deposition mostly the drug allergy what we had 
discussed they are either type 1 or type 4 hypersensitivity reaction so this is again important to understand the mechanism of the type 4 hypersensitivity reaction so de depending on the type of cytokines released by the interaction between antigen presenting cell and the T knife cell that will govern what type of proliferations what type of differentiation happen in the T cell line and depending on that the <coughs> TH1 or TH2 or even TH17 type of cells will come producing different types of manifestations and type 4 hypersensitivity reactions they also have four type four subtypes so what is important if we go through the history we can understand the type of hypersensitivity reactions the patient is facing now if this particular doctor wants to do the skin prick test for drug allergy evaluation what is what will be your opinion so first of all if if she want to do the skin prick test for all those drugs she was exposed to check whether it is right as you again if we go back to the history if we analyze the type of hypersensitivity reaction then what we will find the first episode was type 4 hypersensitivity second episode was type 4 hypersensitivity even that third and third and fifth episodes was type 4 hypersensitivity only the fourth episode which was type 1 hypersensitivity which was to the some unknown chemicals so as uh, professor tripathi sir was mentioning we need to explore more on that part only why the patient had developed type 1 hypersensitivity reaction for that purpose only we need to do the skin prick test specific to the specific history given by the patient not for all those drugs so this is very important and that is why the mechanistic understanding uh, we need to know and as there uh, there is a terminology of drug induced disorder and here we are talking about drug hypersensitivity we need to acknowledge that drug as an etiology here so for that as already dr kureshi has mentioned the importance of history taking so we need to have a detailed history taking detailed medication history taking followed by some clinical methods here also we need to a uh, little bit expertise we need to become expertise on some uh, specific skin manifestations we know what is rays when it is sgs when it is exanthematous pustulosis so these things we need to know about because we need to exclude other things too and finally some lab tests are important as some routine blood tests skin prick test to understand the type 1 hypersensitivity only again and again we need to emphasize on that the lymphocyte transformation test is the future because they can tell us about the t lymphocytes they can guide us about the link between t lymphocytes and different types of hypersensitivity reactions different patterns of type 4 hypersensitivity reactions patch tests are important to understand the type of type 4 hypersensitivity reactions trip test level again only for the emergency purpose here the hla phenotyping is important in some subset but again and again we need to give em emphasis on that history taking is the investigation it helps in the diagnosis and treatment in evaluating drug induced disorders so as we are talking about this hla concept we need to know uh, this pharmacological immunological receptor interactions and sometimes the previous concept of haptin is replaced by this pi concept where uh, there are certain hla phenotype that had been uh, shown by some antigen presenting cell that can be responsible of for some specific uh, serious type of adverse drug reactions already uh, this hla phenotypes had been identified if we can uh, test this we can also predict this type of 
unpredictable episodes. We know this uh, drug allergy or this type of severe adverse drug reactions often we called as type B or bizarre type of hypersensitivity reactions which cannot be predictable. But if we can do this type of test, we can predict those things. So finally, this is from taken from our current updated NMC uh, DM clinical pharmacology curriculum where they are mentioning that that clinical pharmacology is the study of drugs in humans. Clinical pharmacologists are expected to have in-depth knowledge of pharmacological principles as well as clinical medicines, enabling them to provide a wide range of service to society in variety of settings. As Dr. Kureshi has mentioned, the importance of delivering, importance of identifying the correct drug allergy cases. If we apply these two things, the our pharmacological principles with proper clinical medicine knowledge, then we can address these very neglected issues. Drug allergy is a neglected issue. Well, and we can serve our society. So we need to understand the basic mechanism of drug allergy, how to confirm the diagnosis, and finally, the treatment should be a multidisciplinary one. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Shambhu. Yeah, you said it well. So just to put in, in a very nutshell about how we go, so drug allergy is still a phenotypic classification. We classify drug allergy depending upon the phenotype. So in the phenotype classification of drug allergy, we say whether it's immediate or delayed. Okay. Immediate means when the symptom started from when the patient took the drug for the first time. So it's not that the patient took the last dose of the drug, it's not like that. For the first dose of the patient took the drug and when the symptom started. The symptoms are mostly cutaneous, but it could be bicocutaneous, it could be related to respiratory system, the GI system for the non-oral drugs. And that decides whether it is between within six hours or more than six hours, we say it is immediate and delayed. That is the first step in walking up of a drug allergy patient. And then in the delayed, we have various phenotypes. Just we have seen it could be addressed, it could be a acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis, it could be SJ stains or it could be some organ specific symptoms which may be not having any cutaneous manifestations. But important to understand one very uh, one concept is that is the delayed symptoms can be even up to eight weeks or more from the date of the taking the first dose of the drug. So it's very important to have that concept in mind because even within the eight weeks, there's a two two months period before the symptoms occur, the patient can be ha can be the drug which is taken within the two two months period prior to the onset of the symptoms. So on this, we we actually formulate about which could be the suspicion drugs and then we formulate the tests, the test for the immediate test and One other thing concept is important to keep in mind is that the immediate reactions, it could be an IgE mediated, uh, which we test by any prick test like prick or intradermal, or it could be a non-IgE mediated direct mast cell degranulation. <laughs> as we find in the neuromuscular blocking agents, we find in the fluoroquinolones, so they're actually through the activation of the MRGP-RX2 receptor. So this is one of the other important areas to keep in mind because these drugs, they should not be taken up for a skin prick testing, where they can usually, usually they will cause muscle degranulation because of the inherent in nature. So, so the now in the recent update, there's a de-emphasis on the skin testing and more emphasis on the graded drug challenge or the drug challenge testing. Why? Because there are many other mechanisms which is hitherto unknown to all of us, number one. Number two is that actually it encompasses all the all the hypersensitivity reactions, whether it's type one, type two, type three, or type four. And the third thing is that actually it, it helps in understanding the entire spectrum of the disease. But there is important and uh, important caveat in it, <coughs> so this graded drug challenge should not be done for any severe cutaneous adverse drug reactions or where there has been any organ specific egg involvement like interstitial nephritis or hepatitis. Otherwise, we just go about in evaluating and as in Dr. Taha's case, there are other agents, hidden agents, which has to be 
it take in consideration one year sale is is latex another important agent in the perioperative settings chlorhexidin so which is also known to elicit the drug allergic reaction and cause the perioperative hypersensitivity or perioperative anaphylaxis so these are the some of the important areas which we bear in mind while we evaluate and then we are tell uh, the patient or uh, the referral physician about what to how to go go about and if the drug cannot be cannot be a we need to give the drug so the mechanism remains is a desensitization can we desensitize any drug it's difficult to say it may not be all drugs may not be desensitized as yes, but definitely those drugs which have a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction is they are taken up for the desensitization and they give very good results uh, but we have to follow the 12 step or the 14 step process nowadays the drug challenge test has come down to one step or a two step previously we used to have a four step but recent practice parameters say it could be done in one step or a two step for the drug challenge but desensitization is temporary tolerance but it has to be done and started on the drug as long as the drug is within the body is in the system it remains tolerated once it crosses 48 hours as or more the drug the desensitization which has been done it goes goes out so it's a temporary tolerance the multiple mechanisms which have been showed but now not in nothing has been very clearly elucidated as we have found in allergen therapy so can we take any questions now it means any questions regarding this this topic we can have yes sir uh, for reactions other than anaphylaxis is there any uh, specific time period where a person has been taking for a drug for so long beyond which we can rule out or we can say this is unlikely to be allergy like anaphylaxis can occur after any dose of the drug for the other reactions is there any time period where beyond that we can say that this is unlikely to be the drug causing the reaction okay shambhu will you take it so, yeah first of all uh, apart from anaphylaxis i am telling you uh, one example yesterday just yesterday i had faced i can I, I will show you the pictures also there there is one bullus pemphigoid for 7 days 7 or 10 days like that the patient was consuming cetagliptin for last 4 months okay and now she is uh, presenting with this bullus pemphigoid so we had withdrawn that drug and most probably the patient is having the cetagliptin induced bullus pemphigoid so there, there is a four month time duration there are many evidences that suggest there is uh, this temporal relationship <coughs> may, may in, in some times can up to one year also sir in, in in some specific drug rash some specific type 4 hypersensitivity reactions when we are talking about bullus pemphigoid it is important to note because bullus pemphigoid is a overlap between both type 3 hypersensitivity reaction and type 4 hypersensitivity reaction so we know the immune complex deposition the type 3 hypersensitivity reaction this will this will take a long time to sir your take just one example i'll narrate to you 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 must have also come across it uh, this is regarding your question uh, type 4 hypersensitivity, contact dermatitis. Many children who tolerate local neomycin so well throughout their childhood, youth, all of a sudden, at age of 40, 45, they start getting contact dermatitis because of neomycin. Because of other agents as well, this is one of the examples, very common finding, I often come across. I, I was tolerating neomycin till this time, age of 40, 45, 50, but all of a sudden it comes up. So, I mean, uh, dogmatic medicine, uh, 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 this arena is over. Anything can happen anytime now. Yeah, there is a concept which has to bear in mind is that why are we differentiating between immediate and a delayed? Why this cutoff of six hours? Okay, so <coughs> what is the magic behind it? What is so important about it? So what we usually find out, we usually know is, you can say, I think, <laughs> is that if it is a type one hypersensitivity reaction, it requires the generation of the IgE, which has to go and bind itself to the high affinity IgE receptors on the mast cells. And when the allergen in the form of, say here in the form of the drug, it again comes into the system, binds to the high affinity IgE receptor bound IgE, causes cross-linking, sends a downward signaling signals, and causes degranulation of the mast cells. 
So that means there has to be the presence of the IgE in the system. Okay. That is called the sensitization phase. And when the symptom occurs, is the effector phase. We can, we may be sensitized to numerous of the things, but mere presence of the IgE or the mere presence of the IgE bound to mast cells, it does not entail that we will have an allergy to it. Sensitization is an immunological phenomenon. Having an allergy is a clinical, a clinical scenario. So why the six hours is because this is the time when actually the drug needs to go into the system, gets itself bind to the high affinity IgG receptor bound to the mast cells, which are the sentinel cells, the important cells of the innate immune system in our body, and then degranulate it. So that means there is a preformed IgE already in the system. Preformed IgE means it's a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. Type 1 hypersensitivity reaction means there is a window of opportunity to detect and window of opportunity to treat in the form of successful desensitization as we do in allergen immunotherapy. So we can have that this is maybe the patient has taken the medicine for several years but has formed the IgE all through but now has developed the reaction because now again when the medicine has gone into the body it just reacted with the IgE and caused it to release the mediators and cross the threshold and cause the symptoms. But this is another interesting concept. Interesting concept is that the patient gets de novo sensitized. That means the patient had not taken the medicines before, had taken the medicine from today, day one. The patient is getting sensitized. This happens in certain and actually genotypes. So that's what pharmacogenomics comes out to be very important. And patients get de novo sensitized. Say there is a seven day course of the medicine getting these novo sensitized in the first, second, third day and then reacting and precipitating with the symptoms similar to the actually the type 1 hypersensitivity but on day 7 or day 8 when the medicine is there. So this happens in few of the drugs uh, but this concept is also there. Otherwise majority it is the preformed IgE and in all the other apart from the more than 6 hours it's the non-IgE mecha mechanisms. So uh, actually, um, they are act, uh, after this uh, long discussion, one point is absolutely clear that uh, if we are to control this uh, uh, drug allergy or sensitization, whatever we want to do, we should have a very clear knowledge of pharmacology as well as clinical medicine. We shall have to combine these two at a time. and. Uh, Sambo was very correctly uh, said that this part, be it in uh, medicine or in pharmacology, everywhere perhaps it is much, much neglected. And uh, I don't know how many works have been done on this issue. And at the same time, uh, microbiology has got a very specific role to do at the same time. Because we are not discussing about uh, majority of the reactions are type 1 and type 4. We don't know. How many cases are there which are uh, we are missing out and out of type 2, type 3 also simultaneously? So I think, uh, yes. Uh, out of your conversation, sir, uh, I uh, happen to remember one recent incident. Uh, three months back, I was testing a patient for upivacaine. This patient had come to us as a case of allergy with lidocaine. Uh, for a local uh, local anesthesia dental procedure he was doing, had aller allergy to lidocaine, some uh, systemic reaction came to us. Obviously, the next drug you trust the test the patient for would be bupivacaine. It's a substitute. It's considered to be very less cross reactivity with lidocaine. A young boy he was. We tested him. While testing him, he again he had reaction with. Uh, I mean, uh, he tested positive on skin testing with bupivacaine as well. But while I was doing his testing. Actually, I want to come to what Sir just said, this, uh, the amount of neglect. I was asking him, engaging him in conversation. Uh, I was asking, I asked him, uh, what is his family like? He said he recently had a terrible, uh, tragic death of his younger brother. Uh, a sudden death which happened uh, during the night when he was at his friend's home. Then this boy said that we uh, suspected, I told him, was there any reason? He said, no, he was absolutely healthy. But uh, he said, that uh, my brother died at friend's home and we filed a case against the family we did the autopsy of uh, this uh, boy we thought uh, i mean that family friend's family did some foul play 
and we uh, did the autopsy of the body, which was inconclusive. They had got, gone even to autopsy. Then I asked him, did you, uh, this, uh, your, your uh, brother consume any drug there? Uh, he said, no, nothing much, just he had some, uh, this headache, he had a migraine, he had taken some tablet for that. Uh, I told him what happened to him, he said he developed heart attack. I told him what were the symptoms, he said he had a choking in the throat and I immediately got the answer. Probably he had died out of laryngeal edema because of some NACID which likely he must have taken, we don't know, it was just what I presumed to be. So this is the amount of neglect, people had gone up to autopsy which was inconclusive, uh, the case was filed against the family. But nobody ever had thought of this patient. One important cause could be, likely cause could be a drug allergy because of the NSAID. So that's uh, like this. Thing. Like this, many uh, many cases that are also I think are prevailing here and there, and we are missing it out in some way. I think uh, uh, you have more questions. You are developed some uh, allergic reaction to drugs. before uh, the answer is given by the experts, I would like to tell you one thing. This, this question is applicable not only for infant and children. This question is applicable to extremes of ages in old age people and also in pregnancy. So, so there are separate uh, issues of any these questions may come. Definitely it should come. This are just only in case of so one year. Answer to his question. <laughs> fact, I See, I think. Yeah, I will try to be as succinct as possible because of the lack of time. First of all, a patient admitted taking a drug, develops some rash, and there is a suspicion that the drug being injected or given orally is causing the reaction. So whether we can do a drug desensitization at that stage and then we can start it. The answer is a resounding no. Okay, why? Because, because this is drug, drug desensitization is a mechanism, it's very complex. The drug has to be washed out from the body completely. Okay. The immune system has to come back in the homeostatic phase and then it has to be, it has to be challenged in a very minuscule of the doses and brought up. So there is a deviation. We do not know whether it's a break generation of the B regulatory cells or the generation of the T regulatory cells or the blocking antibodies and that helps. So there we stop the drug, we give some alternative drug. We do not do the desensitization at that stage. That is number one. Number two is the regarding your children. You know, it's it's equally important or the more important than children, but, but the thing is that in children the medicines are given by the parents. So history is from the parents. but desensitization or drug testing is is a more or it's a it's a daunting task in children rather than in adults so obviously where the skin prick test though this is very much reproducible and if you can do it even can be done above five years of age it can be done but definitely the drug challenge testing it becomes very difficult because we need to monitor uh, the all all the uh, vital signs and symptoms and it's usually most of the guidelines say that don't, don't approach for it, you just avoid the drug depending upon the history. So that is it, so that is I think what we have right now. And the last thing I'll just add to a take home message, the practice of doing a drug, drug testing before giving a drug is now no more in vogue. That gives a false sense of maybe the drug is can be given and also the false since maybe the drug cannot be given. Because we do not use a non-irritant concentration of the drug while doing the test 
And as Dr. Taha was showing that in the monosep injection, we do it, we do not do it. That practice is no longer validated. It is not right. So do not embark on doing a skin testing with a target injected. So that practice is no more there. So uh, I think uh, there was an excellent uh, brainstorming discussion. But uh, uh, Professor Pipati asked about one hour, but it has crossed one and a half hour. And I think uh, there is a hypoglycemia also to some degree. <laughs> At least I am having. So anyhow, excellent presentation and uh, nice discussion. Thank you very much. We, who needs no introduction, is a consultant clinical pharmacologist. And as panelist, may I invite Professor Prabhakar Reddy, sir, in the dais. Sir is currently the professor, additional professor at the Department of Clinical Pharmacology at Nijam Institute. Also, we have with us online Dr. Shondha Shalvarajan, madam. Welcome, madam. So again, madam needs no introduction. Madam is currently additional professor and head at the Department of Clinical Pharmacology, Jipma Pondicherry. Welcome, madam. We have with us Professor Shukanto Shen. Professor Shukanto Shen is currently professor and head at the Department of Pharmacology at Holdia Institute of Medical Science. So welcome, sir. And we have with us Professor Rotinder Chaj. Madam will join shortly. Uh, Madam, again, uh, she is now the professor at the Department of Pharmacology at Ames Bhopal. And Dr. Shogoto Sharkar was there, but uh, he is very ill now. He is suffering from uh, fever. So he had some message uh, with Dr. Sriyoshi Dashgupta. He, she can share later when our moderator will give the permission. So now may I invite our moderator sir to the desk and take the board, charge of the podium. Introduce the moderator. Uh, sir. Yes, we introduce sir. <laughs> he needs no introduction. He needs no introduction already sir. <laughs> sir. Yes, sir. Shall I get it? I can't do so much. Shall I get it? 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 And you can give me a comment yeah, 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 yeah. separately of this. Uh, Dr. Dhaneri, uh, please, uh, sir, sir, please it should be it should be balanced. Sir, Some senior person should go. Sir, please. <laughs> so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be um, here and. Uh, uh, once again moderating this panel discussion. Um, the topic of uh, today's panel is clinical pharmacology in India, the way forward. It might uh, sound uh, pretty familiar to some people uh, in the audience today, um, but it still is a very pertinent question, I think, and uh, we have at least two hour, uh, one hour for this. It, uh, uh, the original time was one and a half hours. I think uh, we are running late, so we'll try to uh, complete this in one hour. Um, so um, let me just give you a few uh, starting comments before we go to the panelists. Dr. Ratinder joined it. Uh, Dr. Ratinder uh, has joined. We can see her on the uh, her name on the screen. Uh, Ratinder, can I uh, request you to unmute yourself so that we can hear you um, when when uh, when you make comments? 
Okay, we'll go ahead. I think uh, she may not be in front of her. Uh, she did. Yeah, there you are. Uh, rather than that, yeah, hello, hello. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. Sorry, sorry to join late. Great, good to hear you. And you're not late. We we just started. Mm. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Uh, so, I think I'll keep my video off. Sorry, uh, only when I'm talking, I'll just put it on. Is that okay? Yeah, fine. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, as okay. you feel comfortable. Uh, so let me start uh, with a few comments. Um, now, uh, the topic being clinical pharmacology in India, the way forward. So um, before we can look at what the way forward might be, we need to look back on where we have come from. So uh, just a few words on that. And it is not as if clinical pharmacology is something new to this country. Um, in fact, uh, if you really look back, then clinical pharmacology probably started in this country very close to where we are sitting today um, uh, at, at Bengal Chemicals, and uh, which is just a few meters away, I think, um, with, uh, with uh, um, uh, Dr. Karthik Bose and Dr. Ranath Sen, uh, and we have the papers uh, on, on the clinical effects of Raubilfia Serpentina, um, Serpaganda, of that time in the 1930s. Um, so it is, uh, it is really uh, very interesting that we are having this conversation here today uh, at this point very close to where it all started. But clinical pharmacology has not been recognized as a distinct, um, uh, distinct uh, discipline, um, distinct from pharmacology or distinct from any other uh, discipline till um, Dr. Uh, Ranjit Rajaudhuri introduced the DM course in uh, at PGI Chandigarh and you had clinical pharmacologists, labeled clinical pharmacologists coming out with a degree uh, from, from that institute. Uh, so that was in 1978. So we have the 1930s and then the next um, episode comes on in 1978 and thereafter. So Dr. Shiva, if you permit me, I would rather say 1921 instead of 30 in the sense that uh, Colonel Dr. Arun Chopra took over as the chair of the then, that time we used to call pharmacology, but he was the man from medicine. Right. He was given the responsibility to chair pharmacology as a professor in School of Tropical Medicine that started in 1921 and he, used, he started at the same time, from the first day he started OPD. Okay. under the under the uh, department of pharmacology so two opds are run every week hypertension clinic and peptic ulcer clinic okay, okay. run by pharmacology department so <laughs> just uh, to just I, say I, I, I think we should also have a mic somewhere there because it will be required i think uh, as you go ahead um, <laughs> so uh, obviously you know uh, uh, dr tripathi knows this uh, much better than i do he's been uh, there at the uh, Tropical School of uh, Medicine here in Kolkata and uh, uh, so that's uh, a great input to have. Uh, so we have this, these long years in between and then we have uh, the DM in Clinical Pharmacology coming up uh, in 1978. Thereafter there was a slow period uh, even after that about a, uh, about a decade or so uh, when um, there were qualified clinical pharmacologists coming out from PGI Chandigarh uh, but um, uh, but they remained in academia and uh, by and large taught uh, other uh, DM clinical pharmacologists, uh, not too many of them because when I joined uh, uh, in 1988, uh, the other uh, the four seats, two of them were still vacant and I was just one of uh, two candidates who, who were uh, uh, there uh, in that batch um, with two vacant seats. So it was going slow at that point of time and it continued to go slow I think uh, for a few years after that but then suddenly it caught up and um, and so the whole area of clinical pharmacology opened up and there weren't obviously enough clinical pharmacologists so a lot of other people um, took up that, uh, that gap that was there between the need for clinical pharmacologists and, uh, and uh, you know formally qualified clinical pharmacologists. And how did that need arrive, aro uh, arise? Um, that need arose because in 1995, uh, the good clinical practice guidelines um, 
got harmonized across the world and major uh, regulatory agencies in Europe and the US started recognizing studies done anywhere in the world. So here it was, 55% of the world market for pharmaceuticals at that point of time was the United States, another 25% was Europe and another 10-15% was Japan. There was hardly anything left for the rest of the world. And these three organizations uh, signed up to the ICH guidelines uh, which said that if trials, clinical trials and drug development activities are carried out according to these standards, then we don't care where those studies are done, we will accept them. Um, that brought a flurry of uh, clinical work, clinical development work uh, to India initially. And it was thought that India is such a huge country, uh, so uh, the patient population is large and uh, it would be easy to do clinical trials much faster here. Um, that initiated the requirement for clinical pharmacologists, but of course there weren't enough clinical pharmacologists, so uh, pharmacologists, empty pharmacologists who also are good in, uh, quite good uh, at, uh, at being able to handle that um, were able to uh, come in and join and there were a lot of other specialties which joined the pharmaceutical industry at that point of time and thereafter uh, and contributed to uh, the development of uh, clinical development of new drugs coming from the West. The Indian pharmacology, uh, pharmaceutical industry also had to catch up at that point of time because the writing was on the wall, uh, patents had just been recognized in India, um, uh, before that there were only pa product patents, uh, the, uh, patents were de-recognized in the 1970s uh, and they were re-recognized uh, in 1995 uh, saying that by 2005 um, uh, they would be implemented. Uh, and uh, since the writing was on the wall, the Indian pharmaceutical companies then started setting up um, their own research and development center. Things went slow with the Indian pharmaceutical industry for quite a while. Quite a while meaning all uh, up to this time, it hasn't really caught up to the expectations that were there. But companies like Randvac C, companies like Cadiza, Torrent, uh, set up huge research centers, Dr. Reddy's laboratory. Um, and uh, they did come up with some new molecules, uh, but realized that it was not an easy thing to do. So that was the scenario in which now we started requiring clinical pharmacologists not only to undertake clinical trials, but also to look at drug development as such. It's not just the specific activity of clinical trials, but the entire gamut of drug development from preclinical into the clinics and even into the market and strategizing the development pathway uh, and it was not only because India is used to be and still is a small market for pharmaceuticals when you look at it uh, uh, in monetary terms. Um, so uh, it's, it's probably about 5%, 6% of the uh, less than that of the world market. Uh, population is about 17%. So, uh, uh, so even when Indian companies develop new drugs, they do it for the world. They want to market it worldwide. And so the regulations that have to be followed have to be international regulations. And uh, to follow those regulations, you need require a great knowledge of, uh, <laughs> of international regulatory affairs, as well as, of course, uh, drug development science. Uh, so uh, that is where we are now progressing towards. A lot of Indian companies now have uh, new molecules in their pipelines. Um, however, because of a lack of drug development uh, expertise in India, uh, a lot of these companies have actually set up offices in Europe and the US. They are manned by people of Indian origin or even people who have been, uh, uh, have spent their careers in India but now have moved uh, to those countries because the rest of the talent and the infrastructure is available for drug development in those countries. Um, this can't go on for too long. As we go ahead, I think we require that expertise to come back to India because the cost of development is much, much lower in India than abroad. So we are doing our industry and anyone else who is uh, interested in developing new uh, medicines 
to um, uh, to be able to do it in this country and take the advantage of the low cost that we have here uh, and be able to uh, do that for a global market. Um, now, a word about on the other side. This is drug development, generally um, uh, uh, industry centric. But then, I see a revival of clinical pharmacology in our hospitals and in patient care, also in India at this point of time. Um, I see major hospital chains wanting to do much more research and I see that they need the expertise that clinical pharmacologists bring to the table. Very often they do not know that this expertise does exist in clinical pharmacologists and they are not actually specifically looking for clinical pharmacologists. But I do uh, honestly believe that if anybody can uh, really handle this, it is clinical pharmacologists who can take this forward. So that is where we are today. I think there is a revival in uh, clinical pharmacology related to patient care and there is also a great demand for clinical pharmacologists uh, in, in drug development industry. Uh, the question is, what next? And that is what we are going to discuss. Um, today uh, in the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, so as we do that, I want to just say here that, you know, when you talk to clinical pharmacologists, you get the sense that they sense there is a sense of crisis. Some people have told me actually, clinical pharmacologists have said that there is crisis in clinical pharmacology, even though the number of clinical pharmacologists we have in this country today is at its highest. Uh, we have more DM clinical pharmacology seats in the country than ever before. Um, and uh, while I was in 1990, the 11th DM clinical pharmacology uh, candidate to pass out uh, and get a DM degree uh, that year in 1990, today there are over 120, I believe. Um, uh, give or take a few. Um, so, uh, so the the specialty has come a long way. What next? And is there a crisis? So that is my first question to our panelists. Do you think that there is a crisis? And if you do think uh, there is a crisis in clinical pharmacology, then what is that crisis? Uh, and uh, uh, what are its contours? So if I can start with Dr. Prabhakar there. Uh, and ask him what his perspective on this question is. My personal feeling is that my personal feeling is that I think we are coming out of this crisis. We are slowly emerging out because now we have people are seeing the number, but crisis is there. So why the crisis is there the, is that uh, we have the knowledge. We have the ability to solve some problems which clinicians or other people in various departments are not able to do. But until now, we were, per se, were not recognized. So now, with more emergency number, people are walking out. Let's say before 10 years, uh, when I was uh, assistant professor, I just sit in my room and uh, spend my time meet with my friends, clinicians. So it was just a personal impression. Now people are going out. We are forcing the students, we are forcing the staff to go. Recently, we are gladly informed that we had a hypertensive clinic. In so when you say go out, what does that mean? Wards. Oh, go to the wards, okay. No, they, they did not sit in the room thinking we are a clinical form for this. We are putting our brain. So now what happened is that we had a OP long time back in 2005 or where we had a hypertensive clinic. That was just closed because we didn't have any OP at that place. Now we, start, we started the hypertensive clinic and also we restarted the drug information center. So now we have a consultation in the hospital itself for drug information. So we are being, we just had a payment for the drugs. So what we do here is any complications, any uh, most commonly now we are getting about AMR. So this AMR I think is going, if you can really catch hold of AMR, as AM, uh, as people go against antimicrobial distance, 
So AMR is most important thing now. It is in hospital. So Dr. Primak, is this uh, this clinic that you all are running? Is this in collaboration or is the clinical pharmacy? It's separate. Clinical pharmacy. Is dip, uh, running it's totally it? Totally different. And uh, patients come from other departments, other or do they come directly to? Mostly yeah. other departments. Yes. Peripheral. Because and of drug interactions. And how do you go about advertising your presence? Because other departments might not, you know, um, uh, even know sometimes in a big hospital uh, that such a, a clinic is there. When they know it, uh, it might not come to their mind when they actually require it. So what happened was that Comco vigilance started. Area reporting started. So uh, during this time, we started training our PGs. Uh, towards to find out area. Please hold the mic close to your mouth. So once they came to know there is a department, people are active, they started asking doubts regarding drug interactions, what to do in this patient. So with this information, they are well known. So the footfalls in these clinics that uh, uh, is we that? We just started there. We just started. Just okay. there, 10, 15 days now. Okay. They just we are getting known. But basically from inpatients of the hospital, we are now getting around uh, 5 to 8 uh, drug information, mostly regarding uh, antimicrobial <coughs> and drug interactions with uh, various drugs. So the message I'm getting from you, Dr. Prabhakar, is uh, that uh, while a cri crisis existed, we seem to be going out of that crisis. And the reason why we are going out of the crisis is because initiatives you have taken we or, have you know, we have we have taken initiatives. Uh, uh, Dr. Shukant, is do you do you agree with that? Is are you seeing the same thing in your institute uh, in Haldia? Doctor Kant comes from uh, a private hospital in Haldia. Um, uh, so, do you see the same, or, or is the scenario different? And your scenario might well be different because this is a private institution here. Uh, it is not in the center of a big city like uh, Hyderabad. Uh, we are we are talking of Haldia, which is uh, several uh, maybe a couple of hundred kilometers from. Uh, uh, major uh, uh, cosmopolitan center. Uh, first of all, thank you to organizer for putting all of us in a single uh, room. This, this thing we are basically looking for for many years. Hello. So this is the second opportunity and this is the Hello. first thing way forward. Now coming back to my experience, Till yesterday, we are having 704 medical colleges in India. Only 11% medical institute, they are of national importance. So almost 56 to 60 percent, if you conclude the private and the government colleges, they are below average. So my experience during that period, I almost visited 15 to 20 private medical institutes. I am very close to their management. When you introduce yourself, Sir, I am a clinical pharmacologist. So first reaction, ये क्या होता है? ये medical pharma, MD pharmacologist नहीं है। So this is the reaction of the owner of the institute. So now, first you introduce, no sir, this is something different. We are DM clinical person. अच्छा, ये भी course होता है। Just look into things. When you introduce yourself into the academic institute with the doctors, DM clinical pharmacologist. So this way, even the, our colleagues, doctors, they ask for ki isme kya hota hai. So that means we are having identity crisis. Now coming back to the development in India, uh, if you go through the starting of courses, right now there are 15 colleges, institute in India offering clinical pharmacology. So almost 48 seats right now. And if you go through the admission process, I think 60 percent is admitted and 40 in some cases maybe 50 percent left vacant and that vacancy is because of different state government's policy. If you go through the our state of management, okay, if you do a DM for three years and if you have to do another three years, so and it is a, not a promising thing for me. Suppose if you are from Kolkata, it is okay, but somebody from other state, we don't uh, spoil his, his six years for the Kolkata. So that is the limitation with our discipline. In my setup, sir, what in last eight years, what I uh, feel, uh, I had advantage of having DM clinical Okay, everybody, all the clinician, students, and the faculty member, they accepted me wholeheartedly. 
this is the biggest advantage of doing dim clinical courses so everybody is positive about you yes he is something different so only thing how you transfer your experience with your colleagues ki sir aapko ye cheez karna hai you start this new thing sir aap main aapko ek example batata hu suppose we are doing pg uh, general club i'm thankful to professor tripathi sir the way he taught us how to analyze the scientific in our 50 seated medical postgraduate institute uh, nobody of the medical science they don't review the clinic, uh, articles properly so this scale we are having and we have started those activities in our institute and that uh, we am i am getting a personal recognition from my postgraduate i am 50 students and everybody is attached to me so this is the advantage of doing clinical pharmacology and now we are uh, uh, requesting our faculty members clinician to incorporate our uh, exercises uh, uh, expertise in their medical uh, outcome so whatever sir do they are so these are the things which are great thank you so much for uh, for uh, that insight i think what uh, uh, dr sukant pointed out is um, that that there is a crisis clearly there is a crisis because people don't even know that a specialty called clinical pharmacology at all exists uh, and that you can you can get qualified in in that uh, sphere uh, but also he talked about um, uh, what he is doing and that is uh, similar to uh, what dr prakash told us earlier um, that uh, initiatives by qualified clinical pharmacologists and demonstration of their skill uh, is what uh you, you know probably will get us uh to the way forward uh i want to uh, go to dr sandhya uh, and ask her what in a tertiary care government setup like jipa pondicherry um uh, what the scenario looks like yeah uh, even in a setup like uh, jipmar also there is a crisis uh now it's almost 10 years since we start the dm clinical pharmacology course uh in initially when it was started uh, like the previous speaker said the same query used to come what's the difference between uh, md pharmacology and dm clinical pharmacology why are you doing dm clinical pharmacology what is the difference where will you be placed where are you going to work so uh, these kind of queries used to be asked for a long time uh, probably for the last one or two years we are not uh, getting those kind of queries but uh, uh yes us back also we used to get those kind of query and even now when the administration changes when a new director comes the first query will be uh, like what is the difference why there is a separate clinical pharmacology what is the difference between pharmacology and clinical pharmacology so uh, there is no clear distinction uh, between these two uh, disciplines uh, which is known to others so that itself is a crisis and uh, even uh, Uh, in most of the colleges uh, like uh, uh, it's still like the department of pharmacology and uh, after finishing dm clinical pharmacology if you have to join as a faculty you have to join the department of pharmacology uh, and uh, and again when you join there like uh, the other people ask like what is the difference even after doing dm clinical pharmacology you are joining a pharmacology department and you are doing ug teaching so like what is the use of doing this uh, uh, super specialty course so uh, as of now uh, due to this uh, lack of uh, job opportunities especially in academics as the clinical pharmacology departments are very less and what i mean is uh, like uh, separate clinical pharmacology department and uh, most of our candidates have to join pharmacology department if they want to be in the academic setup uh, and that itself uh, like uh, creates uh yeah illusion that there is no much difference between the course at the end of the day you will go and join pharmacology and you'll end up doing ug teaching so uh, not having a separate clinical pharmacology department and uh, uh no job opportunities in the academic setup itself is a crisis and that is a major limitation to overcome that uh, we have to have separate departments where we teach dm candidates and uh, do things which are related to clinical pharmacology apart from ug teaching and other things uh, that's that's the way forward i think thank you thank you so much uh, dr sandhya um uh, 
So what you're saying is that uh, the crisis, according to you, is um, in the fact that the distinction between a clinical pharmacologist and a, uh, for a better word, uh, a non-clinical pharmacologist, um, that differentiation doesn't uh, stand out. Um, and uh, perhaps then uh, what you're suggesting is that, A, we need to have probably uh, a different pathway there, a diff separate department. I'm not sure whether, you know, uh, 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 just that will be sufficient because people will always also keep asking us, why do you have these separate departments? So we have to be able to answer that question. Why? What do you do different? What do you know different? And how is your curriculum different? Uh, and all of those things. Um, last, uh, last year, uh, when we had the same conference, uh, I think uh, yeah, I, I did have the opportunity to make a presentation. And that's the point that I wanted to make. And possibly through the next two days in this conference, we will talk a little more about it. Tomorrow I have a presentation. And I want to uh, specifically chalk out those areas um, you know, where that distinction can uh, you know, stand out starkly. Uh, but I do agree with, uh, uh, with Dr. Sandhya that um, it's not easy to make that distinction. And it is up to us to make that distinction as wide and as broad as possible, as distinct from each other as possible. And uh, we'll have to brainstorm on this. And as, uh, uh, as a discipline, we have to work on this uh, and, uh, and do certain things. And I have some suggestions which we'll speak about when I get some time tomorrow uh, to speak on this topic. But I want to go to Dr. Atinder. Uh, and ask her. Um, uh, she is at uh, Ames Bhopal. Uh, it is uh, a relatively new institute. Um, uh, Ames uh, uh, is uh, recognized as, you know, all the Ames are recognized as leading institutions in the country. Um, and she's, she studied from PGI Chandigarh, so she has the uh, legacy of, uh, of PGI also to carry with her. Uh, Ratinder, what are your views on this topic? Yeah. Uh yeah, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, except uh, you, Dr. Saibal, and Dr. Sandhya, I could not hear, uh, you know, it was not clear what others said, so I might be repeating myself. But of course, now uh, there will not be any repetition in the fact that, as you said, we are a, a new institute, and in fact, uh, uh, we do not even have a DM clinical farm. It has just been approved, and we are hoping to get our first candidate in January. So, so that anyway, we do not have that crisis as of now of uh, being recognized separately. We do have three uh, clinical pharmacologists in the department, and we do, uh, you know, hope, plan to, uh, you know, request for put up in the staff council for. As I, I agree with Dr. Sandhya, this is a question uh, not only, uh, you know, we are going to, we are anticipating right now also when students, uh, you know, decide to do clinical pharmacology. In fact, some of our uh, students, prospective students have already asked, ki, why should we do clinical pharmacology, as Dr. Sandhya has said. And this is something that uh, we have been listening to right from the beginning since we have done our clinical pharmacology uh, from PGI Chandigarh. So, I agree with uh, Dr. Sandhya uh, that, you know, a separate uh, department of clinical pharmacology is uh, something to aspire for. But at the same time, I don't think uh, pharmacology and clinical pharmacology can be watertight, uh, you know, compartments. So we cannot say an MD pharmacology should not be learning uh, what clinical pharmacology, you know, is all about. So I think, as you said, uh, the way ahead, uh, let us discuss, uh, you know, in the future. And uh, I'm not sure, are we, uh, like, you know, what we do. So we don't have clinical pharmacology as such, uh, even as a unit. But as I said, we have three clinical pharmacologists. And fortunately, we, in, uh, we have a good environment, a good cooperation with our medical, uh, you know, uh, faculty. Even though not formally, we don't take formal rounds. But our PGs actually work, uh, you know, take rounds and present the cases uh, during their, uh, you know, as part of the teaching. We also do regular prescription audits where not it's so it's not just doing a prescription audit and uh, publishing it. We we circulate as a one-page PDF 
and to our, you know, the whole entire faculty uh, and staff of AIMS. And uh, not only, uh, and we also present, that is, the, that just happens once a year during our faculty uh, academics. But while we are, you know, uh, analyzing those prescriptions, we have involvement of a medicine person. So it's not that pharmacology just looks at the prescriptions and says that ye, this is correct or not. We have involvement of the clinicians to dis decide whether it is appropriate or not. So that way, I think we are doing a bit of clinical pharmacology. We are also like, I think most of us have ADR review, uh, ADR monitoring centers. We are, we have recently, in fact, uh, been uh, inspired by Dr. Shambo in that aspect and we have opened up our ADR for medication review. So we haven't got much of a response now, but we have also, you know, offered that any patient you feel that he's been prescribed too many, uh, you know, drugs and things like inhalers where you would like us as a clinical pharmacologist to explain to the patient how to take. Uh, or, you know, or just do a medication review, please send to our ADR monitoring center. So like that, we are uh, trying to play a role of a clinical pharmacologist in our hospital. We do ha have access to that. Being a new institute, it's easy to kind of, you know, introduce such things, but we don't have formal <laughs> clinical pharmacology as of now. Right. So uh, thanks, Ajinda, for, uh, for, for giving you us your perspective. I think, you know, many of us have been uh, inspired by Dr. Shambhu here um, of, of the kind of work that is happening and not only Dr. Shambhu, but there are a few others in, in West Bengal particularly who are yes. doing this kind of work. And, uh, you know, it's great to see that uh, at least in one part of the country, this, um, this movement has uh, begun to happen and many others are taking, um, uh, taking learnings from that and wanting to do that in their areas. Uh, I think we should give it a fillip. We should try to formalize this um, this uh, this um, service that is provided to patients and to uh, other other specialties. Um, and we must see how we can expand that. So uh, my thought here is that unless we provide services to patients on the one hand and other specialties on the other to the hospital in general. Um, the value of a clinical pharmacologist cannot be um, uh, cannot be weighed. So uh, thanks for uh, those comments, Satinder, and uh, uh, bringing us uh, onto that topic. I will uh, ask uh, Dr. Dhaneria, a very senior uh, clinical pharmacologist here, to uh, to give us his views. Uh, esteemed uh, colleagues and uh, distinguished delegates. Uh, Sir has covered a lot of things. Uh, I would like to share a few other things. I have been undergraduate teacher throughout my career. Uh, what I see that medical science is a science of integration. Unless and until we have not understood the pathophysiology of illness, we cannot treat the patient correctly. We have to understand the pathophysiology of illness, how the drug interacts with the pathophysiology, and how the patient is benefited. Our curriculum has a shortcoming that we have given much more emphasis on diagnosis rather than the therapeutic aspect. And I think here is a vital role of a clinical pharmacologist being the expert in therapeutics to play. So I think we have to involve ourselves in teaching and training of both undergraduate and postgraduates and uh, we have to share our expertise in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. And also I think we can also uh, look for need-based research. That is one of the important area. We can also contribute after COVID-19, we have seen that our expertise can be, uh, we can uh, extend it to the public health education also. So I think these are the areas uh, I think you can express your views and uh, uh, our young generation can take a lead from that. Thank you, sir.
Dr. Thaneria, your uh, experience comes through whenever you speak. Um, so, uh, Dr. Thaneria made a, this, this wonderful distinction between diagnostics and therapeutics. And I think clinical pharmacologists have that, you know, they, they should be in that therapeutic space where uh, we should be able to assess uh, the worth of the therapy and, uh, uh, you know, the, the intric intricacies of, uh, of therapeutic handling of, uh, of patients. Uh, while clinicians clearly are, uh, uh, are trained as well as uh, uh, extremely uh, uh, good at uh, uh, working on the diagnosis and diagnosis is very important for them, uh, it is quite true that uh, the therapeutic part gets, you know, kind of becomes a little secondary uh, for a lot of clinicians. They get the kick out of being able to diagnose something well. <laughs> Uh, and uh, you will often find clinicians asking for this test and that test and all these tests, they, uh, they probably are not going to help the patient that much, but they will help the clinician diagnose and they want to do it. Um, uh, I think there is a niche for us there on the therapeutic side and um, clinical pharmacologists uh, should, should make uh, the best use of that opportunity. Um, you also talked about teaching. And um, uh, I think clinical pharmacologists, particularly those in the teaching line, should understand what the job opportunities, uh, what the career opportunities in clinical pharmacology are. And they are great. The, the, there are massive um, career opportunities in, uh, in clinical pharmacology. Uh, and it's, you know, there's a starting level opportunity there. And ultimately, then you have to compete with other specialties for the more senior positions because it's not that you know uh, only a clinical pharmacologist uh, you do your specialty job at a particular level but after you get senior enough you have to be able to handle other responsibilities and the other specialties also are able to ha have to do it and uh, can do it and so who gets selected uh, depends on you know how good you were and are in your own specialty and then um, how you are able to also understand the other specialties around you and, uh, uh, and uh, provide a perspective which is holistic. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tanaria, uh, for this first round of discussions. At the end of this first round, uh, we will open uh, this to uh, questions. Before we go to a final round, uh, we are curtailing this a little bit from what we discussed yesterday. We had a little small discussion yesterday uh, among the panelists of how to go forward with this panel discussion. Um, but we are going to change that a little bit. So uh, I open this up to any questions from the audience, any thoughts, any comments. Thank you so much, sir, and sir, Balsar Dipati, sir. Uh, actually, uh, I joined this. You can stand there so that other people can also see. And I joined this course uh, after uh, inspiration from Professor Dipati, and under his guidance, I have done it. And basically, and now you are touching for the. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, now, basically, uh, what we are discussing, the relevance of clinical pharmacology in the arena of therapeutics or arena in diagnostics or arena in patient care. We should, we should think about the patient care service. Because clinical, whenever we are calling it clinical, then it should be related with the patients. So there again, I have some doubt that uh, if I being a clinical pharmacologist, I I am going to advise <coughs> these people who are DM in endocrinology, at the same time giving advice who is DM in cardiology, at the same time who is DM in neurology, who is super speciality in psychopharmacology, uh, neuropsychiatry, or any other specialty. So I had one suggestion from the very first day when sir made one consultative meeting before starting this course in School of Tropical Medicine, I said if there is any possibility of making this super speciality a super speciality one, by means if I am a clinical pharmacologist, I should have a super speciality knowledge in particular domain of uh, our uh, clinical discipline. 
then we can have a mastery over that. But if we want to be a, uh, actually a jack of all trades, we will end up being master of none. So uh, it's my suggestion, uh, it's not a question, it's my suggestion, if we can think over it, uh, it and so that we can maybe sub super speciality sort of thing, then I think still, still, we do have importance in our uh, fraternity, in clinical fraternity, whenever they know that we are DM clinical pharmacology, they give some special importance. But from core of my heart, I know that for application of those knowledge, they are much more advanced than us. It is the basic thing, which is a, a lacuna which yeah, I feel. Yeah. So I, I think you, you make an excellent point, uh, because you know the, this area, as you go deep into the clinical pharmacology of uh, particular specialties, particular specialties, let's say diabetology or allergy or whatever you, and you, you, you uh, like, uh, it becomes very vast. Suddenly it becomes very vast. It becomes very detailed. And uh, the advances in medicine have gone to that extent that as we go into the next 10 or 20 years, uh, where some of, uh, uh, I mean, all of the uh, audience here uh, are still to see those uh, years and uh, they will then be, you know, into their uh, middle career um, when this will start really becoming very complex. Uh, I have been helping some uh, some consultants in uh, in the area of oncology, and it already has become so complex um, the, of of uh, uh, some some drugs which uh, will work only in combination with other drugs, uh, all gene based or genetic uh, early, uh, genetically um, uh, uh, having genetic associations uh, based on uh, either the the transformation of some genes or transformation of uh, some of those genes, some of them uh, working in one direction, some of them working in the other, it becomes very, very complex. So th I think there is an opportunity as well as uh, a threat here. The opportunity is that uh, the, the kind of detail and complexity that is arising in each of these specialties uh, makes it almost impossible for a busy clinician to actually grapple with it and they would probably welcome uh, help with the theory behind and uh, uh, the way things work and also the number of uh, therapies that are coming out uh, and will continue to come out year after year, these will continue to grow uh, and so it's not going to become any easier. Um, the threat is and for which uh, the solution uh, was suggested is to have subspecialization because it is not even possible for the clinical pharmacologist to grapple with those complexities in all those disciplines. So people would have to, I think clinical pharmacologists would need to begin to choose sub-specializations as they uh, go through their courses, see what they like and go into that area and get into deeply into that area and understand. So uh, there are two uh, people wanting to make comments. One is Shango and the other is Dr. Tripathi. I think uh, there are two aspects for what Dr. Nasir has said. Uh, first, it is well taken that uh, what you have mentioned, but then your focus is on uh, clinical pharmacology's role in patient care. Perhaps you have tried to mention that, and whether I'm as a clinical pharmacologist, I'm confident enough to get into the nuances or practices of different super specialties, okay, or sub specialties. Uh, I would rather say if we emphasize more on our strength area, and what is that strength area? Is the pharmacology part. Pharmacology as it is applied in uh, clinical practice. So that is something that we should be confident about and that doesn't mean that you have to be a moving dictionary about uh, drug science, no. But you should have, as a clinical pharmacologist, I have a better skill to interpret and understand and appreciate and give the feedback to a clinician whether there is a failure of treatment response, whether there are possibilities of drug drug reactions because of which there are some kind of crisis. So these are areas where possibly a clinical pharmacologist can actually add value to optimize patient care and for that you even if you try you cannot become you cannot actually substitute 
the expertise of a super specialist in the different clinical domains. But then what is the common thread? Any management, patient management, 95% of it is based on medicines, drugs. And that is the common thread. And that will make a clinical pharmacologist indispensable if, you can, if we can prove our merit in patient care, irrespective of the subspecialties and super specialties. Okay? So that is one thing. But then I uh, take your point well. Could it be from that what we can suggest? That is it possible in the curriculum itself, in the curriculum planning and develop curriculum implementation? Maybe at the very first year of BM clinical pharmacology course, if we try to know from that candidate that what is his uh, interest yeah. area, whether it is cardiology, whether it is uh, pulmonology or dermatology, and accordingly maybe an elective is thing for six months of the three-year course. Could it be placed with the uh, concern department where he can work uh, during his training period itself in tandem with the uh, specialty in that area so that he becomes ultimately a clinical pharmacologist and dermatologist. He is a clinical pharmacologist more towards dermatology or more towards pulmonology like that. That we can think of or futuristically. But given the current situation, we do not have that kind of provision. If anybody does that, it will be at their own level. Okay. So this is one uh, I was thinking that it could be possibly done and so that because you have a clear goal that uh, after you graduate, after you do your postgraduate, the BM clinical pharmacology will be actually would like to be identified as a clinical pharmacologist in pulmonology, relative to pulmonology. And I would rather say in that area it's not to be limited to only in patient care optimization but also all the whole gamut of canvas in reference to clinical pharmacology as applied in practice of pulmonology. So from that angle, it's a good idea. I think we can flag this point and we can have further discussion. And if our society actually makes a formal presence, maybe in a couple of years, then we can make these kind of guidances and uh, our, our suggestions to the appropriate authority so that the appropriately the curriculum can be modified, etc. So yeah, definitely, that's formally, a, that's a but good also good. informally, uh, that can, we can uh, obviously we can happen. That. Okay, that's what I thought that I should. Sir, that is very wonderful that you said that uh, one should, therapeutics is very vast. We have some baseline knowledge about therapeutics when we are doing our MDs and applied science is all about clinical pharmacology and we should integrate that and bring into clinical practice. Now the moot question here is, what if our services are not solicited? I am not a dermatologist. I can't open up a clinic. How am I going to give this advice if I am not working in a clinical setting? Or in a, in, a, in a tertiary care hospital, I can still make a presence. What about the rest of the clinical pharmacologists who are not in that kind of a setting? Right, so this clearly is a question, uh, not a comment. Uh -huh. So <laughs> uh, uh, let me try to answer that qu very quickly, uh, Smita. I do have a presentation tomorrow, so I, I will take up uh, this topic. But uh, what I want to say is we need to provide services. Now, exactly. those services, uh, to my mind, uh, needs to be in the area of research. Most of us, many of us, are working in, uh, in teaching institutions, postgraduate teaching institutions, many of us. Um, uh, and even if it's undergraduate, there's always postgraduate also along with that. Uh, and uh, more and more, uh, it will be required that clinicians have to do research, bring out papers. And you know, if you go and look into any hospital, I don't see these guys having any time to do that. Uh, they require services these days. The level of um, uh, sophistication you require in research has gone up tremendously. The studies need to be done under good clinical practice guidelines. You need to uh, have the right kind of biostatistics there uh, to be able to publish in a particular uh, grade of journal. Um, you need to have um, the analysis uh, studies when they are uh, clinical studies when they are done. Uh, it has moved into the the digital sphere. So there is nothing that is now you know. Uh, while we might go on doing that on paper. Uh, but any good study these days is uh, done in uh, a very different way, in an electronic format, where there is electronic data capture, there is uh, a review of the data as it comes up, 
so if you want to do a good study which will be internationally recognized, you need to follow the entire gamut of things um, that, uh, to, for want of a better word, um, uh, that, uh, say, a sophisticated industrial setup uses to do clinical trials, which is not within the purview of a standalone um, clinical department to do. They cannot set up a data management group. They cannot set, set up a, a biostatistics group. Of course, there can be a biostatistics uh, unit or department within the hospital, but those people often don't have the data management. Um, and if they then they are taking it away from uh, what uh, what is uh, what is something that the clinical pharmacologist is taught to do uh, and should be doing. So um, so I think there are certain allied. Dr. Kasi, what uh, Dr. Smita had pointed out, taking from this. We